This is Desm101. Thanks for tuning in. Today, I wanted to do something a little different by comparing a couple of obscure older systems to each other, just kind of to have a look and analyze some of their qualities and their games and look at some history too. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, CD-based game consoles had a rocky start before optical media format really took off. Cartridges were the standard way of loading ROMs onto a game console for the first generations of home game systems. In the arcades as early as 1983, we saw the popularization of Laserdisc games with Dragon's Lair and Astron Belt. While home consoles would not really begin to widely see CD-ROM based systems until the 1990s, NEC was the first to the market with a TurboGrafx-16 add-on for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 systems in 1988 and 1989 respectively. PC CD-ROM games debuted in 1990, starting with titles such as The Manhole, in addition to other floppy disk ports onto CD format. Many of the more well-known PC CD-ROM games were not released until 1993, with games such as Myst, Seventh Guest, and Rebel Assault. This is a fascinating period of time for game consoles because we saw a proliferation of unique systems and add-ons that would push video games further into the regular use of CD games. Two of those systems we're going to cover today, of course, are the Sega CD and the 3DO. One is an early add-on from 1991 in Japan, 1992 in the US, and the other is a dedicated CD-based console from 1993 in the US and 1994 in Japan. They share a few things in common with other PCs at the time. Today, let's take a look at both of these early CD-based systems and compare some of the strengths and weaknesses of each. First up, the Sega CD. It requires a Sega Genesis to plug into, although there is also a standalone version called the CDX, which includes both systems as well as the JVC XI, but these are far less common than the Sega CD Model 1 and 2. The Sega CD was my first introduction into CD-ROM games, and I was immediately interested in the system, although I could only try playing it at a friend's house several months after it was released. Then, through emulation and much later on in owning one more recently, it was $299 upon initial release and was eventually bundled with Sewer Shark, the Model 2 version. By 1992 and into 1993, CD-ROM games were getting more press, gaining traction in gaming magazines and of course filling up the computer stores at the time. Some very flashy looking games indeed. I was surprised to see that Sega was one of the companies leading the change to CD-based consoles, so I didn't really know anyone who had a TurboGrafx-16 or a TurboGrafx CD at the time. I didn't really know much about the system existing, and some of the games that I was mostly familiar with and associated with TurboGrafx-16 were games like Bonk and Splatterhouse. The Sega CD didn't exactly have a stellar lineup at launch, but their marketing at the time was pretty effective in advertising the system. Plus, games like Sewer Shark showed some impressive technology for back then. You know, think of seeing a movie running on a 16-bit console, and had gameplay that hinted at the potential for what could be ahead. Today, the Sega CD is considered a failure since it had some questionable FMV games and a relatively short lifespan, ending in 1996. That was somewhat lacking in support from Sega. Many of its fans, however, will tell you that the system is actually underrated and is a very interesting system to collect for, and I would have to agree with that. While not having a massive library like the Genesis, it holds enough varied and solid releases that one can keep coming back to the system for a substantial amount of titles that hold up well. Let's have a look. Now I've broken these uh, games down into a few categories. So we'll look at some exclusives, some shooters, and some ports. But uh, it's good to start off with Sewer Shark, which was an exclusive until 1994 when it was actually re-released on the 3DO. We'll talk about that more later. 
Now, Sewer Shark plays like an on-rails shooter where you have to follow a Simon Says style pattern of navigation where you're given directions and you have to repeat them in the correct order as you're given those opportunities and uh, failing to do so will actually lead to your immediate death. You don't have any extra lives, it's just one chance and so it can be very frustrating. The game is very challenging on the, the later levels where you have to constantly be uh, killing enemies on the screen before they attack you and you have to catch uh, energy recharge points which uh, very quickly go by and also do the navigation so it can be quite tricky to actually complete the game now this game while technically impressive didn't really uh, make a great impression with the critics and it didn't um, do too well in the long term of how it's remembered nowadays but still, I think it's a pretty fun game, and uh, even if it's more admirable for its technical qualities. Next is Shining Force CD, which is really a port of the Sega Game Gear titles, but they're so upgraded and redone from the sprite work that they really feel like new games. And it really exploits the uh, ability to put more content as far as music and uh, lots of different uh, storylines. So there's actually three different books that you can complete. And the trick with this, though, is you actually have to have an external memory unit, uh, which used to come on cartridges. And the Sega CD has its own built-in internal save store, save RAM, but it's very limited. And so to get to all three books on Shiny Force CD you actually have to have a larger save file and if the internal memory is completely full on the Sega CD this game will not even boot up so that's something to note if you're having trouble getting into the game you might need to free up some memory on your internal storage and we would have to of course mention Sonic CD this is a very unique and somewhat controversial Sonic game with many new mechanics that are introduced and um, subsequently kind of left. But it remains quite a bit of an oddity that did make pretty good use of the Sega CD's capabilities. So not only did we get multiple versions of each level, but we also have the CD quality soundtrack, Red Book Audio, and we also get the 3D levels as well as a nice intro movie which was very impressive to look at back then when it first came out this is a pretty good addition to the Sega CD and quite a strong release in my opinion it still holds up pretty well today though you're probably better off playing one of the more modern re-releases from Christian Whitehead and it's also worth mentioning that the the ideas and concepts here really feel like a intermediate step between Sonic 1 and Sonic 2. Like the spin dash is just kind of uh, barely introduced here but it feels more fully fleshed out by the time Sonic 2 was released. And last for the exclusives it's The Terminator. A movie based film that is surprisingly good and has some excellent music from Tommy Tallarico, well known music composer. And definitely a great example of what um, the difference the Sega CD could be uh, making if given its own versions of games. You could have some titles like this which just felt like a lot more um, thought out and pretty high quality while not t making a huge use of the CD system other than the audio. This was still an impressive game and fun to play and uh, one to pick up for the Sega CD. Moving on to shooters, uh, we'll start with Silphied. Now this is an older uh, game that came out from Japan exclusively on one of their PC consoles and it saw a port here, or basically an updated version on the Sega CD. And I really feel like the graphics on this one are quite good. The 3D looks well implemented, you don't have a lot of grainy video and the um, sprites and characters 
while quite simple, they still look pretty decent and do the job in terms of engaging the, um, the player with uh, the rest of the game. So it doesn't quite feel like one of those on rails kind of shooters. It's more like a normal, plays like a normal 2D shooter, but it has some impressive backgrounds. Next up is Android Assault, also known as Bari Arm, which it says on the title. Kind of strange. This is one of my favorite shooters for the Sega CD. It's a horizontal shooter that plays very traditional, so you get a standard amount of power-ups, and um, you can charge up your weapon, and also when you get powered up to a certain level, you turn into a mech, which as a kid, that was always a big bonus for me. So this game is unique and fun. There's some good big bosses and some uh, some cool backgrounds, and I do like the music a lot. It's definitely one that I recommend if you're into shooters. Another one worth mentioning is Robo Alest, and this is the sequel to Musha from the Sega Genesis, one of those compile shooters, and it's a pretty good game, but definitely very challenging. Uh, it has a unique power-up system if you're familiar with the Alesta games or um, Musha game. It's kind of tricky to figure out how to focus on just one weapon and power it up specifically, and the enemies are relentless in this game, so... Unless you're pretty good at this series, uh, you might want to think about this one. Give it a try first, because I, I think it's pretty hard. Maybe not everyone does, but uh, definitely an interesting game, and it looks great. For the last of the shooters that I wanted to mention is KO Flying Squadron. Now, this is a pretty rare game. It fetches a very high price, so I say that there's nothing wrong with uh, getting it on a secondary market um, for like a reproduction copy if that's your thing a backup copy works too but this is a very famous cute em up game that has an amazing anime art style and it plays pretty well some really fun and interesting enemies and some pretty challenging gameplay uh, very uh, similar to Parodius so this is another really good shooter for the system Okay, and wrapping it up for the Sega CD, we're just going to take a look at a few of the ports that came out for the system. And the first and most important to mention, I would think, is Final Fight. Now, Final Fight was notorious for not having a good port on the Super NES. While it was a fun and good game, there was levels missing and you couldn't play two-player simultaneous. So here on the Sega CD, we get upgraded music, which is better than the arcade in my opinion. Plus, you get the full game, no missing levels, and two-player simultaneous ability. While it's not 100% perfect and the colors aren't um, an exact match for the arcade, this is a stellar reason to have a Sega CD. Next up is Hook. Now, this is a game that most people probably aren't too familiar with, and I grew up with this one on the Super Nintendo, and I it was one of the first games I bought for the Super NES. And um, I didn't really know that there was a Sega CD version until later. And upon playing it, I actually prefer it here on the Sega CD, mostly because of the music. So not a huge difference. Uh, the colors, again, aren't quite a match for what the Super NES could output. But the music really takes it up a notch. And there's some other examples of games that got ported to the Sega CD that up got upgraded with uh, Red Book quality audio. The next one I wanted to mention is Rebel Assault, and the Rebel Assault here came out in 93 and then didn't get a 3DO release until 1995. So this is an example of a, a bad port to the Sega CD. Now this was a pretty big game for its time in terms of pushing CD-ROM. It was the first CD-ROM only game from LucasArts from what I understand. There wasn't any other releases other than the CD-ROM versions. And so it was really pushing for that look and feel of uh, cinematic experience in gaming. But it was generally kind of um, criticized for having no depth in the gameplay and not really holding up too well in terms of 
you know, keeping gamers interested. It was just kind of a surface level experience and more, you know, as a tech technical demo kind of. But still, it was sold pretty well for its time. So it's really interesting to see that it came out here on the Sega CD. But this is an example of um, something that people didn't really like about the low quality video and the kind of awkward, hard to control gameplay that was typical for these kind of FMV style movie kind of games. And last to mention is Mortal Kombat. And this was a pretty positive upgrade from the Sega Genesis version. So you get better sound and you get um, the blood. So this one was actually rated for mature audiences and it didn't have a, um, the blood turned off by default. So you didn't have to put in a code or anything. It would just already be there. So you have all the normal fatalities. Uh, the one downside though is you got load times from things like Shang Tsung. So, um, you know, depending on how much that affects the gaming experience, if you want it super accurate to the arcade, it's probably not for you, but um, as an interesting curiosity, it was a pretty pretty good version of Mortal Kombat. Definitely not horrible. Thank you.